<clears throat> All righty. Um, okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to um, lecture 14 or lecture 4 in our new semester. Um, before we get started on our weekly theme of religion this week, um, I just want to thank you all for, for coming today. I know the weather is uh, a little bit snowy, um, so hopefully you can all get home nice and easily today. You don't get stuck here. Um, I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, before we get started, uh, the Sociology Launchpad, I know I mentioned it last semester, they are organizing a great event um, on Thursday, January 31st. Uh, so this might seem a bit like jumping the gun, but I, I always, you know, I, I've encouraged you throughout this course uh, to be proactive in using things on campus. Um, so please go and familiarize yourself with the people who run that event. Um, so it's just upstairs, AC321, um, so not, not very far from where we are right now. Um, and this, I think, would be useful for anyone that wants to apply for internships or jobs, um, and then down the line, grad school or post-grad programs in colleges. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. Um, so I re-uploaded the slides for this week, um, and this one is the, um, it's the second slide right after the intro slide. Um, so yeah, so I just saw a little flash of that. Um, so again, uh, if you haven't, or just show of hands, did anyone go to um, any of the previous Launchpad events? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, they're a little bit more catered towards uh, upper year students, I think, but please, you should go. You know, I know oftentimes people are hesitant, but you know, if you don't have anything to say, just say, you know, Lawrence from AO3 sent me here. I don't really know why I'm here, but he said it was a good idea. <laughs> well, even if you say that, trip, but they're, they're very, very, very friendly people. So just go and then, you know, you'll be connected from year one. Um, and then if, you know, if opportunities come up, anything related, uh, you'll already be a familiar face. So again, show up at these things. They want people, they need people, um, and it reflects well on me also if you go, so. Um, okay, so that said, um, we have just about a full month until test two. Um, so once again, for those of you that may have missed the um, announcement, test one uh, was pushed all the way to February 27th. Uh, sorry, test two. Um, so, or the first test of this semester, Remember, this semester we have a test and then a final exam. Um, so I think overall it's a good thing. Um, the, the only difference now is that uh, the test will cover two more weeks of material, but it'll still be the same format. And you know, it, it just forces you to study two weeks uh, extra um, that you'll have to study for the final exam anyway. Because um, uh, as, as you know, the final exam is fully cumulative. Um, the test on the 27th, which I'll talk more about next week and the following week, um, it is predominantly between things um, after test one, so social inequality, um, and until uh, the week before the test, so health, aging, and disabilities. Um, it's cumulative in the sense that every week we talk about recurring themes, um, like theories and methods, um, but I'm not going to be testing you on specifics from earlier chapters. Um, again, the final exam will be a bit different. That'll be more major themes from sort of every single week, um, but a little bit more heavily weighted towards the things in the third, in the third third of, this, of the year, um, so things after test two, um, but again, uh, we have quite a bit of time to discuss the mechanics of all of that. Um, so before the end of today too, before I let you go, um, I'm going to release the, I was waiting as long as I could because I'm still waiting for some of the tutorial leaders to, uh, for one of them to send me um, the questions, um, but I'll release the questions that I've pooled together uh, today before the end of the lecture and show you them. Um, so I've received quite a few questions from people kind of wanting to get started. So uh, you'll have your interview questions that you can use, and I will give you some uh, guidelines on how many to use and kind of how to think about getting started. Uh, we will have a tutorial where your tutorial leaders will uh, do mock interviews and show you what interviews look like. Uh, you know, you'll know once you get started or if you've ever done an interview, 
there's no one way of doing it. Some people, you know, it's very contingent and dependent on uh, who you're interviewing. Some people will just like gab and gab forever so you can't get through your questions. Um, other people, it's like, you know, you're like trying to pry anything out of them um, and they'll just say like, yes, no, I don't know, whatever. Um, so, you know, try to pick someone that you think will, will actually be interested and will give you information, um, but at the same time won't like go on and on and on and on. Um, you know, I'm sure you, you have a sense of people using your, uh, what, what you learned about symbolic interactionism and thinking about, you know, how people present themselves and all of that. Um, okay, so anyway, we have three content weeks uh, before the test two. There's no tutorials this week, no tutorials next week. I didn't want to mess up anyone's schedule because I know uh, there was a no tutorial week. Um, so please just check the updated syllabus and you'll see the next tutorials um, are in two weeks from now. So none this week, none next week. And then the next one we have is right before reading week and it'll be a test review. Um, and then the tutorial after that will be assignment three. So. We'll, we'll, we'll keep up in that way. Um, and again, assignment three is not due until towards the end of March. Um, so you have pretty much one thing due, you have a test in one month, and then an assignment in two months, and then an exam in roughly three months. So something to do for each month in Socio 3. Um, okay, so this week we move on to religion. Um, so. Before we get started with religion, you know, again, our famous binaries in this course, um, it's good to think of religion in terms of its institutional, macro, um, kind of structural components on the one hand, but then in terms of its more individualized components, um, it, the meaning that people derive from it. Um, so when we, as sociologists, when we use the term religion, we're talking more about the former, the structural aspect, uh, the codified religion, um, something that can be studied historically and objectively uh, in a Durkheimian sense. So, uh, religion, as a, religion as a social fact. Um, so Christianity, you can study the year that it was founded, you can study how many followers it has, how it's diffused around the world, you can look at its books, all of that. Um, so that's just one example of one religion. Faith, on the other hand, is the way in which any given person actually responds to and internalizes and engages with that given religion. Um, so personally, so I, I, my religion structurally, um, I mean, I don't know what I am now. I, I'm, I guess I'd be undeclared. Um, but when I put a, when I fill out a survey, if, you know, if I have to answer, I would say uh, Roman Catholic, because uh, that's how I was raised. And I went, I went to Catholic school until grade eight, and then switched to public school. Um, but my faith in Roman Catholicism is not very strong. Um, I'm not a highly religious person, but at the same time, I'm not anti-religious or anything. I just don't really think about it. Um, so we'll have a discussion question group thing uh, later in the class. Um, but as a sociologist, we're interested, A, in what sorts of structurally available religions there are and there have been and how they've changed and all of that. But then we're also very interested in how and why people vary in terms of their actual um, subscription to or faith in any given religion. Um, so just because, for example, Christianity is the dominant religion in Canada, it doesn't mean that A, um, everyone in Canada is Christian, obviously they're not, and B, that even people that self-identify as Christian or Catholic or whatever sect on paper, um, it doesn't mean they all equally uh, subscribe to the values. Um, so, so you'll see in this week, uh, themes that it implicitly builds on in this course um, are the, the, probably the most cognate week or most similar week would be the culture week. Um, and here we're looking at religion as really a set of guiding principles uh, through which people find community, find individual meaning, um, and find purpose um, in life. Uh, this was a central theme for Durkheim that we'll see, um, as well as for, for Marx and Weber. So the three kind of central ghosts of sociology um, all had different 
but um, equally strong opinions about religion's function in society. So um, again, a classic theme and something very uh, pertinent, I think, today in everyone's life uh, as we're considering you know, as technology advances and science advances, uh, the, the, the role of religion is becoming uh, increasingly contested. Um, how it's taught, um, its validity, its, you know, whether it's more of a philosophy. Um, many people have lots of different ideas, so um, I think we'll, we'll, we can have some really generative discussion as we go. Um, so one of the first kind of systematic studies of religion before we get into the sociology of it, really, um, is by the work of E.B. Tyler. Um, so he was an anthropologist, uh, and he was, you know, the study of, the formal study of religion emerged more in anthropology um, than sociology. Um, anthropology, you know, uh, it, it's the study of humans, um, it, that's the suffix, you know, anthro, meaning like human. Um, so anthro anthropologists studied religion as sets of belief systems, um, and they, in order to capture kind of uh, religion in its pure state, um, I believe I mentioned, you know, talking about Durkheim in the classical theory week, that he studied, quote unquote, primitive societies. Um, uh, he had a book called The Elementary Forms of Religious Life, much later than, than Ty, when Tyler was writing, um, but building on people like Tyler and Fraser, um, big anthropologists who went typically um, into quote-unquote primitive areas, places that were untouched by, uh, by the West or you know, formal complex civilization. They would go in and they would study the rituals and myths um, and all the various origin stories that these various peoples both created and uh, lived by. Um, and so, they, again, they varied in terms of whether they actually went to these places or did what was called armchair ethnography, um, which was, you know, essentially um, sitting in a room uh, with tons and tons of books and getting as much documentation as you could. Um, so things like uh, letters written by missionaries, um, uh, letters written by elders, whatever they could get in whatever languages they could, they could read, um, they would try to pool together um, a culture's sense of religion or a time's sense of religion. Um, so through, and, and so Tyler basically came up with this thesis again and, and motivating, it became a huge trend in anthropology and then later in sociology um, of studying more primitive religions as they were called. Um, the, the impetus for this was Tyler's claim that religions became um, increasingly sophisticated um, over time, and they're tied kind of to a society's uh, development and level of technology. Um, so to get at the core of any given religion, to Tyler and to other thinkers, it made sense to go at a less, to, to, uh, to go to a less developed society, because you could kind of see the seeds uh, or, or the, cor the kernel of those religions more clearly than in a contemporary society where, you know, people vary so much in terms of their faith, um, they don't always necessarily follow the same practices, they demonstrate, uh, you know, sometimes even having multiple faiths Going somewhere where faith was much stricter and much more homogenous allowed for easier study. And again, to see something more in its pure state. Um, so, as, so, so seeing um, religion as tied to society and societal development and social development and technology and everything social that you can think of, um, Tyler developed a scheme to categorize religious belief or religious faith. Um, so the stages of evolution were the following. Um, starting in animism, then moving to polytheism, and then ultimately moving into monotheism, the, latter, the last of which, monotheism, characterizes the bulk of kind of mainstream religions, which we'll go through in this lecture. Um, so animism is uh, reflected by belief in the supernatural or spirits. Um, so when you look at many ethnographies, again, which you know from the Methods Week, um, are participant observatory studies where people go in uh, to a given place and, and observe how people behave. 
Um, in many uh, ethnographies of tribal societies, uh, there are accounts of, say, um, witch doctors, uh, people who are, are possessed by, by demons and by deities and gods. I mean, in these sorts of societies, um, these rather than rather than uh, having you know rather than thinking of specific human-like gods uh, or one god figure, uh, there tends to be more a sense of some sort of religious atmosphere. Um, animals, due to their difference, um, of course, from humans, are often seen as arbiters or harbingers of of the supernatural. Um, so, so that's why you'll see in many other cultures uh, there are uh, there's more reverence for animals um, than in, say, a religion like um, Christianity. Um, polytheism is then kind of the emergence of the anthropomorphism or the um, anthrocentrism of religion. Uh, again, anthrocentrism meaning human centeredness. So here you start to move from seeing, you know. Mother Nature and the environment and animals as potentially mystical and enchanted, um, you kind of disenchant some of that and say, well, actually, we are uh, the descendants of some divine realm. Um, so polytheism, uh, meaning uh, essentially multiple uh, gods or, or deities. Um, and then over time, that narrows one step further into kind of the origins, myths, and ideas of a single creator. Um, so then you have things um, like prophets, so the prophet Muhammad and God and Jesus. You have kind of lone figures emerge. Um, they can sometimes... Ooh, that's interesting. Emergency alert system. As of 5 p.m. <laughs> yes! Just made it! It's a sign. Okay. That's interesting. Well, and then there's the web option, so I acknowledge. Okay. So, okay, well, that works out for me. Perfect. Um, I would have been so mad if we all trucked ourselves here and then had to leave. Um, okay, good. So, anyway, so that means if it's canceled tomorrow, at least. Uh, Hey, I don't have to give another lecture, so that's good. And then we have the web option. So, <laughs> sucks to be you guys, but it's good for me. Uh, no, no, so, uh, okay, so, but anyway, so that's why I was saying, I'll try to leave early today because I don't, I'll, like, uh, Freudian slip. I'll try to end early today so that uh, we can all leave a bit early to get out of this weather. Um, okay, so, anyway, that's, te see, technology, as I said, technology gets more advanced. There, I was being cursed. Someone just said, what are you saying? And then the system happened. Um, okay, so I, met, I said polytheism, then we've moved from, and, and again, it's, it's useful to think and kind of just think of images. Again, think of living in like, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, making fun of the past or, or other ways of living, but it's good just to situate yourself somewhere. Um, think of, and this is Tyler's view, not mine, um, so animism, again, when, when anthropologists said societies were this way, the image was of people really kind of living in like an enchanted forest, uh, being beguiled and living in mystery of, of nature. Um, then polytheism is saying, well, we're the special ones actually. So you're kind of enchanting humans and saying, you know, maybe, uh, so think of like Greek mythology and all the different gods. Um, think of Athena and, and Zeus and, uh, and, and all these sorts of different figures, uh, demigods. Um, and then one step further is one kind of divine creator. Um, so it's a process we'll see with Max Weber called disenchantment and rationalization. So kind of as we accumulate more knowledge, we come to doubt um, the, the existing uh, explanations of the origins of humanity and the origins of the environment that we develop. Um, again, that's why in, in the contemporary time, um, you know, uh, there, there's such a battle between many people uh, when it comes to the role of science and religion in education um, and in, you know, uh, being strong folkways and norms and mores guiding our action. Um, so as sociologists too, 
So again, the, the trend marked by Tyler uh, was that societies become increasingly disenchanted. Tyler and Weber talk about this. Um, they become increasingly disenchanted as societies become more complex. Um, we develop more and more kind of logical explanations and uh, explanations to explain away religion or to make it seem, you know, unstudiable and too cosmic and all of this. But at the same time, it's interesting as sociologists to see how even though we've undergone secularization in the West, so we'll cover that at the end of the lecture, but, but secularization, becoming secular, um, that's the separation of church and state. So most nations begin as, you know, religious nations once people come together um, around a religion. So I'm not going to go too much into the origin story, but again, imagine people living somewhat s s split apart, then developing a language, developing common customs, uh, developing common religious beliefs, and then extending into a nation. That's kind of the, the very, very truncated, quick and dirty sto uh, uh, story of nation building. Um, Secularization is when we say, okay, a nation is now sufficiently strong in itself, it doesn't have to be governed by a single religion. Um, so democratic states, well, the Western democracy is founded on um, being secular, uh, that it's not governed by any one religion. Um, however, what's interesting is that as much as you know, America and Canada, uh, as much as they can be deemed secular and separate from religion, um, their dominant religion is Christianity. Um, and we see this reflected um, in the way our nationalism and patriotism are framed. Um, statements like, in God we trust, um, even written on many, uh, you know, monetary notes. Um, statistics uh, in, in the states, for example, of uh, people being much more likely on average to vote for a president if they say that they're God-fearing or they believe in God. Um, people on average also being more likely to marry someone or view someone as desirable if they're religious. Um, even regardless of their religion, sometimes it's been found uh, in studies that people uh, you know, they, maybe they think someone who has some sort of religious um, sentiment uh, would be more committed, uh, which kind of makes sense. They have faith in a religion, maybe they'll have faith in me too, um, and they'll, they'll value, you know, uh, codependence or partnership more than someone who's, um, you know, radically against the status quo or something. Um, so when we talk about uh, civil religion, and this is something we can all think about too. As sociologists, we ask, to what extent in a society that in many ways is almost post-religion or multi-religious, like Canada, where we have so many religious faiths uh, among our, our citizens, um, to what extent does any religion become embedded in our actual kind of social tapestry? Um, so again, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, the content, we're, we're a science-driven era and religious influence is on the wane and we're disenchanted, um, but we know that many people are religious and as we'll see in the statistics in Canada, um, the proportion of certain religious groups is really spiking. Um, and so again, we're in interesting times. Um, you know, the, we'll, well, again, we'll have a question on uh, uh, fundamentalism um, there's, there's a huge, not a huge growth necessarily, but um, it, it's a major social issue around the world, seeing what prompts people uh, to become fundamentalists in any given religion. Um, the search for meaning that people have, why, why might someone opt uh, towards that? Um, so long story short with that, religion, it's not as simple um, as the rationalization thesis presented um, by Tyler and Weber. Um, and again, I'm, I'm imposing that onto Tyler. He more had a kind of structural, primitive to sophisticated view of religion. Um, but, it, but it mirrors, uh, as you would have read in the textbook, what Weber says about things becoming disenchanted and rationalized very well. Um, so uh, I think they, they can be seen as somewhat similar. Um, okay, so before jumping into questions, um, I'll just go over the... Um, some of the major religions that you should know a little bit about uh, just as a sociologist. Um, again, in this course, I'm exposing you to kind of 
Uh, you know, this, this could also, Sochao 3 could also be called, you know, introduction to cool conversation starters or conversation topics, because you, by the end of this, you'll be like, oh, I covered 20 different topics. What the heck kind of discipline is this? Um, so I'm not, you know, by no means am I a huge, huge, huge religion expert, um, but I'm going to try to distill some of the main sociological themes um, of dominant world religions here. Um, again, many of you will know more about individual religions than me. Um, I, you know, as I said, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not a religious scholar, nor am I personally religious. Um, just because of my own background, I know more about uh, Catholicism, uh, just because I was raised that way. Um, but I have studied these, but not, uh, again, it's not my, not my forte. Um, okay, so uh, we'll begin with Christianity. So these are presented mostly in, the order is mostly in terms of um, significance in, in Canada, uh, but, but we'll see later on, it's not totally linear or anything. Um, so Christianity uh, began, um, you know, s several years after uh, Judaism. Remember, Christianity was kind of a break away uh, from, you know, what would then become Judeo-Christian beliefs of the world. Um, so in the year 30 AD, uh, so like 2,000 years ago, um, uh, uh, you know, stories of Jesus and the Holy Trinity uh, really started to emerge. Um, so there are over 2 billion followers of Christianity around the world. Um, and this number, I believe, has remained relatively stable. Um, so proportion, the proportion of the, po of the global population, which is around 7 billion, um, this being you know, just under 30%, that's been roughly stable over time. Um, and there, there aren't really any signs of it you know, majorly increasing or decreasing. Um, but Christianity is, is mentioned first, often again, because when you think of uh, co colonialism, uh, you know, neoliberalism around the world, any sort of thing to do with globalization, many discussions are about how Christian values have been imposed in different places around the world. Um, Islam is the second largest and fastest growing religion, so we'll see that when we look at Canadian statistics as well. Um, so. Uh, sorry, yeah, I don't remember all the, you don't need to know the dates, that's why I didn't put them on the slides, but I just, uh, I made sure I had all the dates just so you could have a mental image if you wanted it. Sorry. Um, so, uh, Islam was founded, and, and these founding dates are rough, and that's why I didn't put them up. Um, there are, you know, they did, there, are, there are tons of debates over when exactly something was founded like this. Um, so Islam was founded in roughly 600 AD, um, so, you know, 1,400 years ago. Um, and it was a, it, it imposes or it ideals, idolizes um, a state as a theocracy. Um, so when I mentioned civil religion and secular societies, again, the church is separate from state. Um, theocracy is a form of government in which God is seen or, a, or other supreme beings are seen as the supreme civil rulers. Um, so essentially, a theocracy is where politics are a subdivision of religion. Um, so remember Gramsci and Marx talking about superstructure. So for Marx, for conflict theorists, everything in society had an economic base, right? Um, you couldn't look at anything without looking at the economy. In theocracies, you can't look at anything without looking at the religion. Um, again, it's not to say everyone is totally religious and pious in that sort of society. Faith is different from religion. Um, but at a macro level, understanding it as a sociologist, you would see that the vast bulk of the norms and traditions in, that, in a theocracy would be in relation to religion. Whereas in a secular society, you would presumably uh, have uh, a wider variety of actions and practices and norms that had very little to do with religion. Um, again, uh, theocracy, again, just like polytheism, so th uh, it's like a religious society, crass, uh, the, the suffix assi means of society, assi, I just said assi, but um, it's, uh, <laughs> um, if you think a democracy is of the people, um, right? So it's a place of the people, demos means people. Um, so all these little language tidbits you'll, you'll learn. Um, so Judaism is one of the oldest religions. It is 
200, uh, sorry, 2085 BC, so over 4,000 years ago. Um, remember, BC goes backwards. It's before Common Era, it's, uh, and uh, uh, now we're in Common Era or AD. Um, I think it's easy to think of it as uh, BC and, uh, and CE, because then it's before Common Era, BCE before Common Era, and now. Um, so roughly 4,000 years ago, Judaism emerged. And again, it, uh, it's, it's extremely old, but is also tiny. Um, there are only six million followers around uh, the entire world, compared again to the over two billion uh, Christians. Um, and remember, Christianity is kind of seen as a response uh, to, Ju to Judaism. Um, so Judeo-Christian uh, is kind of uh, the overarching belief. Um, so the, the main difference between Judaism and Christianity, um, and again, within Christianity, there's so many different ones like Catholicism and, and the biggest one in the States anyway, Protestantism. Um, the main difference is the, the role of um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, when the way you would uh, pray in, in, uh, in Catholicism and Protestantism. Um, for Jewish individuals, there is much less mediation between God and you. Um, so it's a, a more kind of direct, um, orthodox is what it's called. It's a more orthodox, uh, ritual-based religion than Christianity um, and its subsets of Catholicism, Protestantism, and others. Um, Hinduism, so you'll see there's a little bit, I have in my notes of this, there's a little bit of um, arguments. I think the textbook uh, sided with Hinduism here in terms of chronology. Um, but if, if you do your own research on this topic, uh, you'll see that the origin of Hinduism so, uh, ranges between 1500 BC and 2300 BC, so an 800 year span. Um, there's, different, there's different ideas about who really founded it and when that happened. Um, so depending on your sources, you'll see it's definitely, these are the two oldest, um, just which one is older depends on the sources. Um, again, I'm not, I'm not a huge expert on this, but um, this, this is something I knew from before this anyway. Um, so Hinduism doesn't have a single founder, and as we'll see, it, it was highly influential um, in shaping other religions uh, that really were and are more faith-based, I would say, than institutionally based. Um, so here, the, the main goal in Hinduism is seeking spiritual um, and moral truths. Um, in, in Christianity, Judaism, um, and, and many other religions, it often is more about following um, doctrines and rules and guidelines from leaders. Um, Hinduism, and then we'll see as in, in Buddhism and Confucianism, are much more about your own practices of faith. Um, and there are over a billion uh, followers of Hinduism, making it um, one of the, to the top three um, global religions. Um, so now Buddhism. Um, so as you'll see, Buddhism grew out of Hinduism. Um, Buddha is the enlightened one. Um, people that many people convert to Buddhism. There are now courses at U of T. It's very interesting. One of my um, there's, there's, there's a, a growing connection between psychology and Buddhist philosophy. Um, so, show of hands, if anyone has ever tried mindfulness meditation? Yeah, so, so mindfulness meditation now has become secular. Um, there's often a lot of backlash against that, though, so you can look up, like, critiques of yoga and critiques of, like, Western uh, mindfulness. Um, some people say it's cultural appropriation. Um, which, you know, it, it comes from, uh, from other philosophies. Um, so so f some people do get critical of, um, of, of meditation and yoga for that, uh, the way that it's used and kind of marketed. Um, but the idea of achieving nirvana, um, not the grunge band with Kurt Cobain, but the, um, the uh, oh good, some of you know that reference. Okay, I'm not that old. Um, so, um, but achieving a state of nirvana, being one with yourself, that very much echoes um, what psychologists study, uh, and I studied a lot of this when I, when I was more interested in studying video game addiction um, and video game use. 
Um, this state of Zen being one with your environment is very similar to what psychologists call flow, um, a state of being one with your environment, not uh, reducing your stress levels, reducing your self-doubt and your anxiety. Um, so there's been a huge surge in Buddhism really as a way of life and, and a form of practice kind of outside of the confines of it as a religion. Um, so again, Hinduism, Buddhism, and then Confucianism, you'll see, are much more, um, in terms of their global appeal, um, I would say, uh, you, you can take things out of those religions. Um, and that really emphasizes the importance, of, uh, as a sociologist, of seeing to what extent are religions powerful as kind of structuring, organizing principles and institutions like churches um, and guidelines and rules versus uh, kind of everyday strategies uh, for thinking about your life. Um, again, I've been reading a lot of things on careers and leadership, um, and there is a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a very popular paradigm right now um, about being authentic, true to yourself, um, you know, uh, seeing relationships as reciprocal, the idea of karma, um, knowing that um, there are cause and effect in a person's life, thinking, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, so, so this is a very, very influential uh, faith, even outside of the context of its religion. So it's, it's been used uh, quite a lot. Um, and Confucianism, similarly, so it's, uh, it's more ancient. Um, so Buddhism, Buddhism originated in 560 BC, um, so about 1500 years ago. Um, Confucianism doesn't have uh, a totally set date, um, but, but Confucius, um, I believe, was between 300 and 600 BC, um, as the textbook says the year. Um, so uh, he was a great kind of philosopher, uh, and his writings um, you, can, you can read. There's a, a short book um, that, that he wrote, his, his famous book, um, and he basically writes principles by which you should live your life. Um, and again, not in a dogmatic, sort of rule-based way, but like in Buddhism, more about being mindful of yourself and your surroundings, trying to be authentic and disciplined. Um, and this Confucian ethic is very dominant um, in, uh, in the history of China. Um, when you, in the textbook, when they talk about you know, the East and China being more collectivist and the West being more individualist, um, there's often what's called a Confucian ethic. Um, that led to uh, China's both economic success, but also the prevalence and dominance of, uh, of families as an institution there. Um, you know, strong child-rearing practices there um, and, and keeping communities tight-knit. Uh, came from this idea that respecting yourself and respecting your kin, um, like Durkheim said about families as well, uh, will lead to a strengthening of the social order. Um, so really, in Confucianism, again, um, seeing yourself as part of a small microcosm of society and thinking, well, if everyone does this, um, then the whole society will, will grow um, in this tight way. Um, and then lastly, before we get to fundamentalism and atheism, which are kind of, uh, you know, two, two, the two polar opposites of faith, um, are Jehovah's Witnesses and Sikhism. Um, so again, these are not all the major religions in the world, but um, these are the ones the textbook focused on, and I think um, are, it's just good to have some baseline information about. Um, so Jehovah's Witnesses are very recent, um, again, in, in the context of Socio 3, where we go really far back in time. Um, so Jehovah's Witnesses, again, are responding to, so Christianity responded to Judaism, um, and then within Christianity, Catholicism and Protestantism are the two major ones, and they have different views about the role of the church. Um, and then Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, they challenge um, Christianity, uh, so in, in 1870, so, so quite recently. Um, and here they challenge, again, they challenge uh, directly the Holy Trinity idea. Um, so the specifics of this uh, are, are not super important. It's more showing that uh, religions are very dynamic over time in that they're constantly contested even by members of their own sects, um, S-E-C-T-S, -S, so div subdivisions, a division of a religion is called a sect. Um, and this is relatively small at 8 million followers around the world, um, so the same size as uh, 
Judaism, or the Jewish faith. Um, and then lastly is Sikhism. Um, so this was founded around 500 years ago, uh, and it has 20 million followers, and um, it is more, it's, it's similar to Buddhism and Confucianism. It's concerned more with life on earth. Um, so this was a big theme. I'm not getting too much in this class, but sociologists, because I, th I think this was more important um, 100 years ago than now, but sociologists uh, often categorize religions as being either um, inner-worldly or outer-worldly. Um, so to what extent does a religion talk about life on earth and being kind of the best person you can be here and appreciating all that is magical about life here? Um, or uh, to what extent does it talk about the divine outside and the afterlife? Um, so again, in Christianity, afterlife is huge. Um, you know, the, the idea of being damned to hell permanently is kind of the biggest thing you can have as a Christian or Catholic. Um, you know, you have to confess so that you don't go to hell. You can't, you have to obey the Ten Commandments so you don't go to hell. All of, all of these things. Um, whereas in Sikhism, Buddhism, Confucianism, it's less about that and more about um, having meaningful interactions in your time here. Okay. So those are the core religions. Again, we'll have a lot of discussion. Just have them in your head, kind of, uh, and we'll see, we'll, we'll go through them again later, but just so, you know, again, the ones that we're talking about here, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Jehovah's Witness, and Sikhism. Again, only pick them based on kind of global dominance. Uh, no particular other reason why. Um, now, so those are the religions. As I said, some of them are more based on structures and routines and others more on, you know, strongly invested faith. Um, again, you can think of stereotypes of Catholics, I know very clearly, that just go to church on Sunday, um, but then don't really do anything else religious, versus someone who is Buddhist, who, you know, may not technically be part of a big organized religion, um, but lives a much more kind of conscious, aware, um, seemingly religious life. Um, so fundamentalism, on the one hand, and agnosticism and atheism, they're two different things, but they're kind of, they're very similar. Um, these represent two polarized ways that a person can have faith. Um, so fundamentalism is about uphol upholding the tenets uh, of a religion very strongly. Um, so fundamentalists are often seen as, uh, so in, in Christianity, they're people who take the Bible literally. Um, so they take scripture at face value the bulk of the time. They don't always have to. Again, this is a broad category, but fundamental means, you know, the, fund the fundamentals of something are the roots of something. So fundamentalists look at the, the core meanings of religion, um, and they see them as extremely important um, and often will demonstrate intolerance uh, to people questioning their religions or bringing in other ideals. Um, so again, you can kind of think of yourself, let's, if you are part of an organized religion, um, like I would say I am on paper, you can think of yourself, okay, um, if f fundamentalism is a 10, uh, and as we'll see, atheism is a zero, where do I fit on that? Um, to what extent would I challenge criticisms of my religion? To what extent do I follow its doctrine? Uh, to what extent do I think it could change or be wrong? Y you would kind of see yourself somewhere on that spectrum. Um, so if, if fundamentalism is a 10 in terms of belief, um, atheism would be a zero, um, and agnosticism would be near that. Um, so atheism is uh, someone strongly convinced um, that there are no supernatural forces. So remember, this is where it ties back to Tyler. Remember Tyler, the anthropologist, said societies phase between, or, or evolve from animism, which is supernatural non-human, to then polytheism, which is supernatural human, and then um, monotheism, which is one supernatural uh, human-like entity. Um, so atheists reject all of that. So anything supernatural, no. Um, the, they would either believe nothing or they would believe just in like the Big Bang um, and evolution. Agnostics take it, I mean, and this is where it's interesting, I often consider myself agnostic. Um, agnostic is 
the whole question of whether God exists is impossible to know. Um, an agnostic person is often, um, again, I think of myself as a teenager, I was like, you know, just one of those questions, or as a kid, even before that, I guess, just one of the questions I had was, well, you know, like there are so many different religions, my friends believe in different things, how do I know I'm believing in the right thing? Um, so agnostics are kind of at that point, um, in a very philosophical way, beyond just, you know, a kid's reflection, um, they start to say, you know, if there is a God, how could I ever know? And if there isn't, so similarly, how would I know? Um, so, so they just, they say, how could I know if I'm a, I'm a creation or not? Everything we're doing on Earth could be some divine game. I have no way of knowing and I don't really care. Um, so, so being agnostic, the word agnostic has moved out of religion. Um, if you say, you know, you, uh, It'd probably be a weird thing to say, but if someone said, um, you know, oh, what drink can I get you if you're like on a date at McDonald's or something, and then you say, oh, I don't know, I'm soda agnostic, it means you like all sodas equally or it's impossible to know which one's better because they're all so amazing. Um, so agnostic, you, you'll hear the word after this course, I'm sure, because it's used all the time. Um, it, it means you don't really have a preference. Um, but it comes from this, which is very different. It's not just having a preference. It's more a philosophical position. You say, it's impossible to know. I'm not even going to ask. A atheism is, yes, I know that it's not real. Um, so again, on that spectrum, an agnostic could float anywhere between one and like four. If, if, and again, I'm just making up the spectrum to, to have you think about it. Um, but again, if someone literal is a 10 and then someone against is a zero, an agnostic person is someone maybe that could be convinced one way or the other. Um, but in their mind, they're like, it's impossible. So maybe I'll be religious, maybe I won't. Um, okay, so on that note, so for study buddy activity number one, um, so, again, this is what interests me mostly. Again, I'm really interested in, in why people hold on to the beliefs that they do. Um, so, what, just something to think about. I think this is one of the most fascinating things. Why do you think people vary in terms of their connection to religion? Um, so, I'm not asking, you know, why are some people uh, Muslim and why are some people Christian? Because uh, you can kind of, you know, look at history and see why, you know, people fall into the cultures that are around them and all of that. Um, but why do you think people of the same culture vary in terms of their connection? That's something that interested me. Um, and I think will help, will help you kind of get these, these themes more about religion versus faith. Um, so questions to consider when talking with your study buddies. Um, what prompts some people to become fundamentalists while others become atheists? Again, think of people that are part of the same community. Um, try, try not to think of people you know, in different spots, but try to think in the same community, even the same family, same neighborhood, why might some people become fundamentalists while others atheists? Um, and then also to think about to answer this question of why do people vary, um, why are some people strongly connected to their belief systems while others have weaker connections? Um, so, you don't have to be a fundamentalist to be strongly connected to your religion, right? Um, I know a lot of people that, you know, in my family that are highly Catholic, but they're not fundamentalists at all. Um, they, they, they just live very spiritual lives, um, still a few notches below, you know, really being a quote-unquote Bible thumper or something. Um, but, but religion's very central. So the last, so again, all of this is, why is religion more central? Uh, in, uh, in uh, a person's life for some people than others. Um, so just discuss with one another again, and it's a good opportunity to talk about your own religious affiliation if you want to, questions you've had, um, and we'll, again, we'll kind of build through these uh, study questions into how, as sociologists, we try to make sense of this difference. Okay, so just talk for a few minutes, and then we'll take our break. Why do you think people vary in terms of their connection to religion? Yep. Because I was baptized as a, as a child and went to a Catholic school, but I'm no longer really religious. And that's mm. because when I'm, because I'm Anglican, my father's Catholic, my mom's Anglican as well, um, but I went to a Catholic school. Even though they let me enroll, I wasn't allowed to participate in First Communion, my confirmation, a lot of like their practices that are like traditional of Catholics. So. And they also, I wanted to convert when I was younger, but they wouldn't let me unless my mom converted, which she didn't want to do. Mm. So I never really got that sense of like inclusion and like right. community. I was like kind of pushed to the side. And when I wasn't in like the school system anymore is sort of what my, my beliefs kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the student in the front um, talked about how 
your own experiences with a religion uh, could make you more or less religious as a person. Um, so again, many people I just know, uh, again, uh, just speaking to my own experiences as someone that went to Catholic elementary school, uh, many of my friends uh, are not practicing Catholics anymore, and for many of them it was those same ideas of thinking, you know, oh, they say it's all about community, but that's not what I experienced. Uh, whereas for other people, conversely, who were not religious uh, growing up, they often become religious in later life, like people like born-again Christians, because they meet some Christians or whatever religion they're looking at, people that convert to Islam and other religions, um, they see other people finding a lot of meaning and say, oh, maybe I can too. Um, so, yeah, like all the other themes we, we discuss in this course, um, people's affiliation to and connection uh, to a given social fact um, are, are highly dependent on what they see. Yep. Uh, we were talking about like the sense of like belonging, community, and things like that. That also comes from like milieu. That's a big factor. Like, for example, if a person was born into a very religious kind of like household, that mm -hmm. becomes the norm for them. So then they're going to develop this like really strong relationship towards like religion, um, religion and like faith and things like that. So that's a functionalist perspective. But on the other hand, I know that Marx talked about um, like um, religion can be like um, obvious to some people. So mm -hmm. they like you know that's that's something that I thought about. Yeah, yeah, so but, uh, lots of themes there. So in terms of the socialization week and the family weeks, uh, re religion, whether someone's religious, uh, is largely dependent on the way they're raised and the friends that they had growing up. If your parents and friends all kind of talk about religion being, you know, this fantastic thing that gives meaning on the one hand, or even something like obligatory, um, you may think that yourself. Um, and then also thinking of, of inequality, though, and, and, and uh, you know, we'll get to that later, but conflict theorists, um, when they talk about religion, they look kind of statistically at how many people that follow religions uh, very strongly are economically or socially disenfranchised. Um, so in times of economic recession, religious belief kind of grows, um, and you'll often see a lot of marginalized populations within a country um, taking on a lot more faith. Um, that connects to the idea of, of that's particularly strong in Christianity, um, because as I mentioned, Christianity's outer-worldly. It's about thinking of, of uh, the afterlife. Um, and so, you know, I know just from my church in North York, oftentimes people would, um, you know, single mothers, uh, people in horrible situations from their own perspectives, they would say, you know, how do I cope with this? Um, and religion was, in a Marxist way, um, a, a strong coping factor for saying, well, this is this life, but I know I'm a good person and I'm going to go to heaven. So religion plays that function as well, which conflict theorists say prevent you from revolting and, and, and stuff like that because you think, uh, well, you know, this is just the, the present life. The, my true life is in another realm. Yeah? Yeah, so like what you just said about that, do you think that really relates to that? Something that we talked about in our first class, which is agency. Mm -hmm. when you're in this place of feeling a, a severe lack of agency, whether it's economic or just in the world, we feel like a lack of agency, that's why people feel need that. With, with faith, there's an uh, abundance of agency, because your faith is not this. Yeah, well, and I mean, and this is one of those, those endless questions, right? Because, um, you know, Mar the, the conflict theorists are right and wrong in some ways on this because uh, contemporary studies on religious belief have shown that people that are religious often have better mental health than people that aren't. Um, and, and it's giving, because, you know, oftentimes people can get, I just know myself, um, as someone that's not religious, oftentimes I ask myself, you know, oh, what's the point in, in suffering through this? I'm going to get a new job or get new friends or whatever. If, if your go-to is kind of thinking of your faith and how to be a good person according According to your community, oftentimes you won't ask those sorts of big questions. Um, so in a way, so it's a long-winded way of getting back to your answer, some people criticize religion for taking away people's agency, but then for others, from, from that perspective, from a mental health perspective, it empowers people because they don't have to ask all those sorts of dark existential questions because they take their religion on faith. And taking something on faith means, you know, they give it the benefit of the doubt. If you give your partner, if you, you know, a faithful relationship is that you trust 
one another and, and you have that foundation of reciprocity. Um, if you're very untrusting or very jealous, um, then you don't have faith. Um, operating on good faith is thinking like the honor system. Um, so, so anyway, so long way of saying uh, definitely this speaks to structure and agency. And when people get in big debates, uh, which they, you know, if you watch Sam Harris podcasts or anything now on kind of contemporary intellectualism, um, there are a lot of people debating about uh, the role of religion and science in shaping people's agency. Um, so that, that's probably the central kind of fault line. To what extent um, uh, is, do, do, do religion provide people uh, with, with good things uh, versus indoctrinating them? Um, when people get really upset at religion, that's usually the word um, that, that's used. Yep. I just remembered why I mentioned uh, Marcus, yeah, Marcus yeah, in the capitalism, because like fundamentalists, I think they believe more like, strongly the more like oppressed that they feel, the more kind of like you know uh, coercion that there is in their society, the more like they're gonna grow kind of like stronger uh, faith in their wonderful religion. So that's what I wanted to think. Yeah, and that's the big um, growing kind of global crisis, right? When you see on the news, people turning towards fundamentalism of any religion. Um, and it's not just, you know, a lot of times ISIS really brought that to the fore, um, but it's not just, um, Islamic religions or, or, or a, a branch of that, there's a wider trend in fundamentalism, which isn't even just like f organized religion. When you look at the, the growing uh, sects, you could call them, of the far right around the world, um, that the same logic follows that in times of crisis and doubt, people are craving meaning and oftentimes they'll become radical. And so, you know, you could be the opposite. You could be in politics, you could be a left wing radical, a right wing, all right, whatever. It's the same principle of you're like you want deep meaning that you're not finding in religion so you get it in politics you could get it in school you could get it in video gaming or whatever so it's, it's the same again these things are so interesting as a sociologist it all comes you know you could replace religion here why do people vary in their connection to anything um and then you know did you the last question before our little break yep. uh, I feel like Yep, and it's just like politics in that way. We're in an extremely, for all the great progress that's being made, one thing that's huge right now, I mean, we, we are in a time of, um, you know, polarization. Um, and atheism and fundamentalism are both growing at high rates. Um, and, and I think to the student's point, it's largely because um, it's kind of, you know, that they're arguing against each other. Um, and when, when you argue with someone, a tendency is you embolden their own position rather than win them over, right? That's why it's not good when you want to change someone's mind to attack them. Um, so yes, fundamentalism, and again, it's an interesting time because both of them are rising, we'll see, in Canada and around the world. Um, so people fully rejecting and fully accepting, um, which again, on both sides, if you do either of that, um, and I'm not saying it's not being critical, but if, if you think of any sort of argument and people are being adamant on either side or the other, that's very much against kind of the idea of, you know, critical learning and, and, and uh, you know, being a well-reasoned citizen, um, unless you really have a lot of reasons to justify yourself. But there does seem to be a tendency to just say, yes, it's right, no, it's wrong. Um, and as a sociologist, that's, um, that's somewhat disturbing. Um, okay, so on that happy note, uh, we will take, um, I guess, because I want to let you guys go early, um, we'll take um, a five minute break till 3.20, um, and then we will, um, not to be confused with 4.20, um, and then we will, so that you can have time for 420 after. I can make that joke now that it's legal. Um, not at U of T, though, because you can't smoke at U of T. So anyway, you'd have to run out in the snow. Um, so we'll, we'll come back at 320. Um, and then we're more than halfway through the lecture. And then for those of you that want to stick around, I'll go through the assignment. But again, um, I don't want, you can watch it on the video, and I'll say it next week, because I don't want anyone to get stuck in the snow. Yep. Um, so now we'll go over religion in Canada, and then the theories, um, and then we will have uh, our, we will end the class with a discussion of the assignment. Um, so as we all know, uh, living in Canada, uh, we are one of the most religiously pluralistic societies in the world. Um, again, Canada, 
key in our charter of rights and all our politics um, is multiculturalism. Um, and again, religion and culture are intimately connected. Uh, cultures grow out of religions, religions grow out of cultures. Again, depending on which anthropologist you talk to, it's kind of a chicken and egg story. Um, but religion, as I mentioned, is usually uh, seen as marking kind of a group's first search for meaning. Um, it emerges as language emerges and everything. Someone finds the origin of religion really funny in the back. Okay. Um, so we are largely a Christian nation, um, again, reflecting our settler colonial roots. Um, and as I mentioned, Christian missionaries and other individuals coming into the country. Um, and our immigration rates reflect, uh, or, or sorry, uh, they affect religious distribution. Um, so here's a big chart. So here, again, I want to just give you some numbers, but I also want to see what jumps out at you here. So testing a couple things. I want to see if we're all able to, to read charts um, as sociologists and uh, to, to kind of pick up on trends. Um, so what is the, uh, what, what's the most uh, widely assumed religion in Canada? Okay, yeah, Roman Catholicism. And what's the smallest? Why, why, people are all saying different things. What number's the smallest? <laughs> no, that's 300. Seek. Right? Huh? Oh, we're looking at different numbers. Okay, yeah, that's why. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, now. Right. Okay, so the trend. Yeah. Okay. So, okay, so looking at 2011. Yes, Roman Catholic, and then the lowest is Jewish. Um, and then, yeah, I guess, sorry, Sikh and Hinduism and Buddhism have grown very greatly over time. Um, so what other numbers? There's some numbers on the percentage change uh, that are, yep. That the are, number of people that like, have no religion almost doubled. Yes, so reflecting what I was saying before, um, if you look at the changes, it's really interesting here. So Protestantism going down by 8%, that's really significant because its number was 9 million, and Protestantism is the major religion of, the, of America, right? Um, so, so going down by 8%, it's a small number, but that's almost a 1 million drop, right? Um, and then no religion, that's huge now. Almost 8 million uh, Canadians, 24% of the population say no religion. Um, so either they're undecided um, or their religion, you know, they, they didn't feel, uh, maybe it was an other category that wasn't represented, um, or they're atheists. Um, and that's a huge jump. Um, and then we see uh, many, many more um, <clears throat> other Christians. So, so things here could be, um, uh, so this is people that are, uh, report things like born again and evangelical, um, things that could be more fundamentalist. Uh, and then also uh, the biggest increase, as I said, around the world, um, Muslims are growing at the highest rate, um, and that's representative in Canada as well. Uh, I'm good, so I'm good. I'm glad you got uh, the difference between 1991 and 2001, uh, 2011. Uh, that wasn't my mistake, that was part of the test. Uh, so you're reading the years correctly, um, so good. Okay, or was I, or am I just making mistakes, who knows? Um, so again, this, the, the representation in Canada and the trends over time uh, hopefully reflect uh, what I was talking about before in my presentations of the religions, um, of kind of which ones have been mostly dominant, and then those trends we're noticing now. Um, again, sociologically it makes sense that uh, people would be less religious over time, um, but it's an open question in, in terms of thinking, you know, what does that mean? and the fact that Orthodox Christianity and Christian not included elsewhere are increasing, many of those people could, all, could be uh, rather fundamental in their beliefs. Um, and so that speaks to the same process I was saying before um, uh, that Nora mentioned about people becoming more uh, potentially polarized. So again, these statistics make sense in terms of the current uh, political climate we're in. 
Um, so the theoretical foundations of this, this will be quicker than some of the other weeks. I've just decided to go. Um, the contemporary theories make sense for religion as well, um, but they're slightly more self-evident. Um, so I'm going to be focusing more on the classical theories, and then we'll briefly talk about, they're not on the slides, um, feminist theory and post-structuralist theory, uh, which the, the textbook covers the contemporary theories really well. Uh, but again, religion it was, was absolutely fun fundamental uh, to the studies of Marx, Weber, Durkheim, um, and Comte, every, every kind of classical uh, sociological thinker you can, you can think of. Um, uh, so functionalism, and sorry for the fun, it was hard for me to get all of this on one page. Um, functionalism emerging again with August Comte. Um, it, it's first kind of big foray into religion. Comte, he had his idea of how societies would become uh, positivist. Remember the positivist stage was when you moved out of the realm of religion and then into philosophy and then into science. Um, Durkheim studied uh, re religiously dominated societies. Uh, so building on people like Tyler, he studied quote unquote small scale primitive societies to look at the totems that they had. Um, so Freud had a book, uh, Sigmund Freud called Totem and Taboo. Uh, so he was looking at religious symbols, so objects that, that are significant in terms of their meaning for a group, and taboos, which we covered in the Culture Week, um, sanctions against activities. Um, so, you know, it being taboo um, as, as a Christian to disobey one of the Ten Commandments, um, like, like to steal or a murder or whatever. Uh, taboos are kind of negative laws. <clears throat> um, so Durkheim, when he studied these early societies, he found something that would become a common finding by anthropo among anthropologists, sociologists, and theologians. Um, theologians being religious scholars. Again, theo, uh, theology, the religion. Um, so he found that uh, among that uh, across religious groups, the core kind of categorization that they had, again another kind of famous binary, was what he called the sacred and the profane, um, and this had lasting significance. Um, so the sacred were objects and aspects of life um, that were set apart from the humdrum, everyday, mundane ness of our worldly affairs. Um, and the profane was everything else. So what did this, what did this mean? Well, um, this meant that life could be seen in terms of actions and persons and entities that were godlike, literally, so coming from some sort of supernatural power. Um, so in Christianity, things like holy water, the church as a space, um, versus profane things uh, like your cell phone uh, or the mall or your clothes. Um, things that really had no greater meaning than the everyday meaning we subscribe to them. Um, now, you can, the word sacred uh, has, has taken on other meanings, but that core meaning of kind of having this extra value, this extra human value, uh, still exists today. Um, so when you think of something, when you say that it's sacred, um, you know, usually the, the, the word, um, well just I want to see you, what's the most common word you think that would come after sacred? I know it comes up to mind for me. So if you're thinking of an object, yep. Sorry? Yes, books, so sacred text. That's usually, so the sacred text is, so the gospel, um, any sort of, so when you think of a religion, the first item that comes up is usually their book of doctrine, their book of rules. So a sacred text, so those are words that guide everything on this planet. Um, again, atheists would say, no, the sacred text is like um, the periodic table and evolution and things like that. So it's something that governs uh, a governing principle. For Comte, remember, he wanted positive laws. He, he, he wanted to make sign, uh, like a scientific gospel um, of rules to live by. Um, and again, profane is so, so what this, the significance that this had, Durkheim's study, um, was he, and what made this functionalist uh, for him, and again, this, you know, as I said, functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism, even though they're the three core schools in sociology, um, 
the people that we call uh, functionalist conflict theorists and symbolic interactionists didn't use those terms. Like Durkheim didn't walk around saying I'm a functionalist. It's more post hoc, like after, you know, after he became uh, pioneering in the field, we then look at his work and say, oh, the implicit assumptions in his work was that he saw all this unity between things. Um, but part of what made him a functionalist was his view of religion. Um, so, so in religion, remember his overall view of society as an organism, everything being connected, he, in the wake of the French Revolution, when meanings were changing, uh, people were becoming much more of what would later become atheists. Uh, people were rejecting uh, quote-unquote dogma, so both of the bourgeois elite, of feudal lords, and of the church. Um, they were using enlightenment principles, autonomy, liberty, freedom, intelligence, all of that. Durkheim was very afraid um, because he said, well, if people move away from religion too quickly, uh, remember he studied suicide. He said, if you move away from religion too quickly, you might f uh, feel a loss for meaning. Uh, people throughout history have been religious. And if you just kind of trash it and say, we're beyond that, we're scientific now, we're rational, uh, we're rationalists, not, not religious people, um, that could cause people to have a huge chasm in their sense of self. Um, so Durkheim had, a, he, uh, in the functionalist perspective, also subscribed to by uh, people like Talcott Parsons, um, religion has five key functions. Um, so as some students mentioned, uh, people join religious communities to get a sense of social stability in their lives. Um, so religion, like, like, like education and work, uh, provides you not just with, you know, philosophical or spiritual norms and values, but with a routine. Um, so if you pray a certain number of times a week, um, if you attend ser religious services, um, if you have conversations, if you volunteer in certain ways, those are all things that structure your life um, and, and make you part of a network. Um, so U of T, uh, uh, St. George, St. Michael's College, um, and, and many of the colleges have religious uh, origins to them, and, and I think St. Mike's is still where uh, you can do masters and PhDs uh, in theology. Um, so there, there's a huge uh, legacy there of that. Um, connected to structuring your everyday routines um, and things you kind of, you know, expect, um, it's very connected to your social identity. Um, so the kind of person you are, so that was my big question about religion and that I, we all talked about, you know, to, why do people vary in terms of their connection to either organized religion or faith systems like Buddhism um, or, 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 you know, even minimalism is becoming a sort of faith system. Um, you, know, you know, people now are uh, trying to reduce their carbon footprints, uh, leave as little trails behind them, um, and, and it's very connected to the, to the sort of uh, Buddhist karma way of life. Um, or atheists. Uh, many of those people are atheists, that, but that still uh, believe that, you know, meaningful life, meaningful work is important, even if it's not for some otherworldly thing. Um, so it provides you routines and community, uh, uh, gives you a role within that community, um, and then provides social control. We'll see that's where, uh, that's where Marx and conflict theorists really make their intervention. Um, but here, social control is more positive. Um, so it can be, you know, we as Christians don't tolerate these 10 behaviors, the 10 commandments. Um, we believe these, you know, are wrong and immoral. Um, with Marx, you'll see it's framed quite differently. Um, but social control here is more about maintaining standards that you believe in. Um, so again, giving you meaning, saying I'm a good person, this is how I'm living, I'm doing this. Um, and then lastly, again, connected, provides a sense of meaning and then gives you a social service function. Um, so, you know, volunteering, being altruistic, uh, people do those things not always just out of the goodness of their own heart. I mean, maybe they are, but they also do it because it makes them feel good. Um, so there's, there's, you know, it's the concept of reciprocal altruism, um, that, that for many people, uh, being empathic, being kind, it's a two-way street. Um, the, the idea of karma, too, right? That you, what goes around comes around. That's, that's a kind of common trait that many people have. 
Um, so Durkheim says for many reasons, and the functionalists say for many reasons, religion is an important social institution, just like the economy and the family and the education system. And then if you pull it out of a society, it's like taking out the, the liver or something. So, so you, know, you could really be messing it up. You could be killing the, the organism. Um, so for Marx, there are many similarities, and, and for conflict theorists more generally. Um, basically, I think the easiest way to think of, and this, you know, and really functionalism and conflict theory, they represent um, wider society very, very easily in terms of its views on religion more generally. Wider Canadian society or even, you know, global society. Um, functionalists on the one hand, you know, would take a more quote-unquote conservative approach to religion, saying that religion, like any other enduring institution, should be taken seriously, whether it's right or wrong. It's not about that. Remember, Durkheim said anything that's social is a social fact. It's not about its validity. It's about the fact that it influences our experiences, and so we have to take it seriously. Um, so it's more neutral in that sense. Conflict theory, on the other hand, they see, yes, it integrates people, gives people meaning. They would agree with all of that. The one disagreement they would have, though, comes from their central assumption of everything that they study, um, which is that at the base of religion, which is part of the superstructure, remember, anything cultural to a conflict theorist is superstructural to what? To the economy, to the kind of market relations that are in that society. So Marx would say, if you go one step further, all of those sources of integration are unequally benefiting certain people. So his famous quote, it's a longer quote, and oftentimes people, uh, you know, academic types get mad when it's uh, taken, they, they say it's out of context, um, but he says religion is the opiate of the people. Um, and, and the quote goes on to say, um, you know, it's, it uh, soothes the sigh of the oppressed creature. Um, so basically he says, without religion, people would realize their misery. Um, so remember, the idea of the 99% and 1%, a bourgeoisie and proletariat, free laborers having nothing other than their physical bodies to labor in factories and, and assembly lines, all these things he was talking about. He was very critical of religion, not, again, um, not, not for anything that it said, but more for the fact that he said it was elites that were promoting religion to say, yeah, you know, like, don't really question your life, don't question the status quo be religious, think about heaven and all of that, and don't critique the institutions around you. Um, so, so think of C. Wright Mills, again, in the sociological imagination, where he says, um, you know, we need to see how structures impact us, and we need to see how many of our personal problems um, are, or existential problems are actually social. Um, this is the conflict theory intervention into religion. Yes, everything in functionalism says it's tr all that's true, but uh, we have to realize that religion may be fostering exploitation by soothing people rather than letting them get agitated. Um, remember, Marx thought the oppressed people would get together around the world and form like a global revolution. Um, and so religion is kind of preventing that by making people happier with what they have. Um, so again, he's not critiquing any particular religion, but more seeing it as a tool of, remember Gramsci continues this, of hegemony. So something you just take for granted, which then makes you take the economy for granted, which then makes you take your poverty for granted, or whatever um, other way you're disenfranchised. Um, so here, religion is used by the social, political, and economic elite to control workers. Um, again, so he would go and, and talk about civil religion. Remember I said, you know, how in America, there are statements like in God we trust, uh, and many of the statistics that show that uh, Christians are seen favorably he would say, well, that's tied to the foundation of America and the way it was colonized by people with that view. Uh, and, and all of that is to justify um, economic liberalism and all of these things which favor elites. So again, it's the similar story you see of functionalism being more about how things evolved and the functions they have, and then conflict theory going, uh, adding a, a critical dimension to that and saying, who's benefiting from this? Is this the only way this could be? And again, and again, the economic base. In conflict theory, there's always the, the economy is the base. 
um, because it's a move away from philosophy and spirituality and into the practicality of everyday life, saying ultimately people need resources, and that's behind everything we do. Um, and then lastly, just again, more simple, symbolic interactionism is always, I like to think of these three schools as kind of, you know, functionalists and conflict theorists are fighting, and then symbolic interactionists are in the middle, kind of taking the best aspects of both. Um, and, you, you know, they're really the most practical turn. This is where sociology becomes more social psychological based on interviewing um, and just looking more at data. Um, so they say, well, you know, looking at, looking at uh, religion, religion is a component of people's identity. Um, you can look at that in a positive way for people, you know, that go to Sunday school, that, that are tight with their friends, or you can look at it negatively. If there are people who bracket out and don't think about things that are objectively harsh in their lives or unfair and, and just, you know, turn to their religion and become hyper-religious. Um, that same tendency, again, can be very good for people. Um, so the sake of, I, I think of the case of my grandparents um, in, in Trinidad. Um, I'm lucky enough, three of my four grandparents are still alive, um, but my grandmother, um, uh, my, my paternal grandfather passed away about 11 years ago, and they were already, you know, quite Catholic, but when he died, she became extremely religious. Um, she, she watches the, the network in Trinidad, it's called uh, EWTN. Uh, so, I, I don't remember what it stands for, but something, television network. Um, and she just watches church sermons, like all day, all day, all day. And uh, she goes, she was going to church five days a week at age 91, just going all the time. Um, and it was a huge thing for her. Um, so, symbolic interactionists would say, um, yeah, you know, religion can be absorbing. Um, and sure, if you're looking at it like a conflict theorist, that could be bad if it's preventing people from revolting, but it could be really great in people that are, for people that are bereaving and for people that are going through crisis and grief. Um, it's, it's a sense of meaning and community that, you know, she wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, so this, so they say uh, part of how religion sticks around, uh, remember uh, the, uh, when we were studying symbolic interactionists in the first term, they were interested in how norms and values, which are really just abstract things, they were interested in how those stick around over time. And so symbolic interactionists say the study of religion is a way of seeing how norms serve as social glue uh, by, by letting us see how, how it's the enactment of rituals. Um, so rituals serve uh, to, to make religious tenets and faith systems remembered. So you may not always know why you're Catholic, but you know, okay, I have a rosary and I'm going to say Hail Marys um, and, and, you know, Our Father who art in heaven. Uh, I'm going to go to church once a week. I'm going to pray before I go to bed. Those keep your, um, your role in the Catholic community alive in your head. Um, it's also social bonding, going to church, having conversations with people about your faith or about the Bible. It regulates your moral behavior in that, again, through rituals, through conversations, you're reminded of what your own kind of thresholds of tolerable behavior are, what your ideals are. And then lastly, these, ac these activities can be very empowering. So again, for someone who is suffering from disenfranchisement, for someone with a double consciousness who's being stigmatized in a community, turning to their faith could be the only thing they have. So again, it's always very important um, to, to give both functionalists and conflict theorists and something like this, and really anything, to give, to give them both credit, um, depending on the context. Because um, you can see, again, how uh, people in their own lives, they, they alternate very much between being um, highly religious highly non-religious, um, and it usually has to do with to what extent they think, you know, do I want to be that kind of moral person? Is that moral to me? Is this empowering for me? Is this not? Um, again, this is where debates over religion's role in society really become uh, heated across people. Um, and so this becomes the, the kind of personal debate. Um, Anderson and Taylor studied this, and they said typically when someone is uh, converting, so they were studying religious conversion, so people, uh, you know, it would be interesting to do these studies on children. Maybe in the future they'll, they'll do more of that. Um, but for ethical reasons and methods reasons, it's kind of hard to study that. Um, but studying adults, they said typically uh, re religious conversion, uh, you know, ascribing to a faith has three phases. 
So the first is a person has some general questioning, either they're doubting the tenets of the religion they're in, or if they're non-religious, you know, for the reasons I talked about before, maybe they want more meaning, maybe they want new friends, maybe they've moved, whatever it is, they're in some phase of questioning. And then, you know, when you're questioning, you're more open-minded, so you may incorporate a certain religion that seems to fit your values pretty well, and then you intensely go into it. Um, so it's like forming a new habit. Uh, you know, you, uh, it's, like, it's like starting a new exercise, starting a new sport, starting a new game, a new course. Uh, you, you're selecting a round, you pick one, and then you try to form it, uh, you know, you try to internalize it. So again, symbolic interactionists, as usual, are less focused on big philosophical black and white questions, yes and no, um, and much more just about, okay, let's just study life as it is and see how people make sense of this very complex thing. Um, because then as sociologists, we can just measure that. Um, and we can debate it as well, but we don't have to get as much into it. Um, so just for a few minutes, and then we just have one more slide, and the last study buddy question you can just take home, because uh, it's more just things to think about. Um, and just for a few minutes, just because again, this is such a, uh, I find religion such a great topic just to talk about. Um, which theoretical perspective do you think best explains religion? Um, so which applies best to the Canadian context, and which, so I've kind of said this a little bit with symbolic interactionism, again, there's no right and wrong, you, you know, these are things you'll vary on throughout your life, and, and, uh, but, but just to get you thinking about how sociologists would study this, um, which, which uh, perspective provides the best tools for studying religion as a sociologist? Um, so again, when you're answering questions like this, you want to think, okay, what assumptions about religion do each of the three theories make? Maybe some don't really have a lot of assumptions. Maybe some have a ton of assumptions. Um, and based on your own life in Canada and the life of your study buddies or the life, your life around the world, which one do you think um, is the most amenable to really, if you really wanted to understand religion, which perspective do you think would be the most useful for that? Okay, so just talk for a few minutes. Um, before I said, because I, I want to let you out at four, and then for those that want to stick around, I'll discuss the assignment. Um, I'll try to do that quickly too, so hopefully we can all be done. Um, I, I'm happy to stick around, but I don't want people to feel they have to stay in the weather. Um, so just does anyone have any quick observations or answers to this question that they'd like to share? Yeah. Um, for me personally, I think symbolic interaction is significant because like, for example, like I wear this um, cross like every day because it's just like a source of guidance, safety, and um, good luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, great response, symbolic interactionism. If you're more focused on just thinking, okay, what does religion mean to any given person? Uh, symbolic interactionism is very useful for, again, kind of bracketing the noise of the bigger questions and just saying, well, for many people, uh, you know, wearing contemporary, what you'd call a totem, uh, something significant of that religion provides you uh, with, with um, you know, just a sense of safety. Safety is, uh, that's one of the correlations that psychologists find. Psychological safety, they call it, feeling of well-being, um, those are higher among religious individuals usually, and it's correlated with the extent to which they attend church services and perform uh, rituals and things. Um, okay, yeah, so again, I think, you know, there is no one answer, and people debate over this. It depends, again, all of your choice of theory is always nested in your research question. Um, so if you were looking at a community that, say, um, tended to stay economically marginalized over time, and you thought it was because of the religion, um, then you may take a conflict approach. If you're interested in how and why religion evolved over time, and you think it had nothing to do with the economy, that would lend itself more to functionalism or symbolic interactionism. Um, you know, and it depends on, it, would, it varies across the world. Sometimes I think religion is, does have a much more economic story, and then at other times it's much more symbolic and interpretive, and at other times more about outright cohesion. Um, so as, any, as everything in this course, uh, these theories are all valid, but it depends on what exactly you're trying to prove. Um, which I know sounds a bit like a cop-out, but that's what makes social life so complex um, that, you know, we don't, we don't know the, the full answers yet. Uh, we're still addressing things. 
Um, so the last thing to leave you with on this, um, I've mentioned it throughout many, many times, um, it's a relatively simple con uh, concept despite the kind of big name, um, but secularization. Um, so this is where uh, Max Weber, again, I didn't really mention him, um, but I, I've mentioned him a little bit throughout the course. Uh, he is kind of seen as the main founder of symbolic interactionism or interpretivism or subjectivism. Um, and he's focused more on, he, he does both macro and micro, but he's seen for really looking at how individuals find meaning at a micro level. Um, and his, his rationalization thesis and disenchantment thesis were again that as societies become more technologically and economically sophisticated, they will become less religious and more technologically and, and uh, industrially based. Um, so think of contemporary Toronto and Scarborough 2019. Uh, when you look at the everyday rituals that we perform, they're highly secular, even among religious people. So the common rituals today, um, you know, aside from like brushing your teeth and bathing and whatever, uh, it's, you know, looking at social media, uh, looking for a job if you don't have one, uh, flipping through Instagram, all sorts of, well, social media is huge, Netflix, TV, uh, reading, all, almost all of the activities that, that we do and the associations we make um, in what Tocqueville calls voluntary associations, which are basically just groups that we form in clubs. Um, the vast majority of them are non-religious. Um, and many people, you know, when they critique things like quote unquote um, millennials and Gen Zs and stuff, w when they're critical of them, it's that the younger generations are treating technology in a religious way. Um, so secularization is really interesting. Uh, I talked to a student about, uh, about this during the break uh, in that, you know, the question that comes with this is, even though religion statistically is becoming decreasingly important for most people, um, where is our faith going? So if you, know, if you view these two things as not mutually exclusive, so if you say, okay, there are religious systems on the one hand, but then there's the idea of actually being religious. And you can be religious about things that aren't religion. So that's the word faith, right? It's having faith in something, treating it as sacred. Um, you know, you, when I was a pro gamer, games were definitely sacred to me in video games. That was my number one thing in my life. Um, you know, the more I read about careers uh, and, and psychological well-being, um, you know, the same reason that well-being improves your mental health, um, being tightly connected to your job, to your family, to your community, all of those things improve your mental health too because you treat them as sacred. You take them on faith. You're not doubting them. You're not in a state of crisis or liminality kind of in between places. Um, you know, that's what makes it hard for marginalized communities and people with double consciousness, right? That they're thinking, uh, you know, where should I be investing my time? Are people really going to like me? Religion brackets a lot of those questions. Um, and so the question now in kind of post-modernity or whatever you want to call this era is, if not religion, then what are people going to be religious about? And is that good or is that bad? Um, so when people get panicked about technology, uh, destroying our social skills and stuff, um, it's again that, you know, people will turn away from the family, they'll turn away from the markets, and kind of just become glued to, to screens. Um, so long-winded way of saying, um, even though religion's moving out of the formal infrastructure of society, when, as sociologists, when we're looking at the process of it being removed, we want to see what people are actually doing with maybe that extra time or that less structure on their lives, or that reduction of structure. Um, so just to think about this, so again, this is just a more a broader question than the other ones, just something to think about at home um, and with your families, with whomever. Uh, do you believe that there's sufficient evidence of secularization occurring in Canadian society? So, so on two levels, right? We saw with the statistics that many, many people are still religious. And then, as I just discussed now, even though formal religion may be on the decline, um, you know, the evidence of people becoming more polarized and argumentative about topics um, and, and atheism going up and fundamentalism going up, um, that kind of makes it seem like secularization is not happening in that linear and pure of a way. Um, and then also, you know, th things to ask as a sociologist, let's say certain religions are diminishing, like Protestantism. We, uh, you noticed, we noticed that many of them weren't. 
Um, I mean, the, the, the raw numbers were going up, but the proportions were going down. Um, but, but secularization is not equal. Some religions are, are narrowing more quickly than others. Why is that? Um, and then again, what, to me, what's most interesting is, even if the religious affiliation plummeted, what I would be interested in is like Durkheim, I would say, well, where are people reallocating their faith? Um, because I don't think people just lose that part of themselves overnight. Um, if you're not believing in religion, are you now believing in science? Are you believing in, you know, humanitarianism? What are you believing in? Are you believing in, uh, like, economic? Do you want to be rich? What is it? What's guiding your life? Um, and that was really Max Weber's main question in the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism. Um, he said capitalism in the West was based on Protestants um, rejecting, uh, you know, the, the physical church and kind of building the kingdom of heaven on God through accumulating wealth. Um, and he, he feared that once Protestantism went down, which we saw in Canada, it is going down, um, that what was once this kingdom of heaven on earth uh, would become an iron cage. Uh, so once the values were gone and the Protestantism was, was uh, divorced from like capitalist structure, that then people would just feel they're in like a mindless bureaucracy, entering jobs that don't have meaning. And I know that's a feeling a lot of people have nowadays, myself included, every now and then. But our religious views change over time. Um, so before the activity, so for those who want to stick around for a second, so I, 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 I did promise I'm going to do these things. Um, so I have questions for you and questions for me on Mentimeter um, before we go. Um, so question number one. So, so this, this is just, uh, I think it's open-ended. Um, I just, or word cloud. So if you just type in, I want to know, and, and by this question I mean in general. So not just this class, but everything. I genuinely want to know. So how is the semester going for you? What words come to your mind? It's going. Okay, well that's like neutral. Stressful. Okay. Great, lit. It's hard to get back after Christmas. Fine. Stressful. Better, okay so far, okay. I'm getting a sense, enjoying it, stressful. Okay, not cute. No, what is it, okay. Oh, that's how I feel sometimes. I'm so free, it's kind of suspicious that I'm freaking out. On the other hand, I'm watching TV again, that's good. Studying better. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I'd give that a five out of ten. People are kind of around the middle. Um, so, what did I have? Okay, sorry. So, okay, so I can come back to that after. Um, okay. Okay. So, before we go, I'm going to show you um, what should I call it? Uh, for those of you that checked my my growing YouTube channel, I tried. <sighs> You know, it's really, it's, it was very, very hard. I, I, I ha so I have the images, so I'm not, I didn't, you know, re renege on what I was going to do. I have all the images for the theory week, and I made it, but then a lot of you had said, and even emailed me, you know, like, the discrepancy between the images and the, and the text or the narration was fun, um, but maybe try something more, you know, literal. Um, and then I tried to do that for theory, and I just couldn't. Like, I don't, the software, I can't really draw things, um, so I have... So I've uh, commissioned a couple of artists I, I, from this class and the other section, so one from each. Um, and then I'm going to have someone do a song too. So for the final one, for the exam, it'll all come together uh, with like a, whatever, crowdsourced amazing video with art and everything. But I'm limited by the technology, so right now I'm, I'm going to make pictures, so I'm trying another format right now. So I just want feedback on this, um, and if this is, if this is helpful um, or not or whatever. So I think I can just actually public. Um, so this is on theory. So it's again, part of, I want, I'll be, I'm saying, so this, this is on week three, um, but it should be helpful um, to contextualize anyway, so you can kind of treat it as part of this lecture. But So I made, I made a live one. Three foundational theories of the shape of the sociologist's 
spirit of the house comes, and then follow through by key figures such as the Neil Durkheim and Tommy Parsons, this theoretical school emphasizes that social institutions operate best when they're in safety, responding to enlightenment values such as autonomy and free will, and then looking at social levels that occur as a consequence of these values being lived out, such as the French Revolution in the case of Durkheim. Where faith in the state or nation greatly diminished while the significance of individual choice greatly amplified. These thinkers argue that the primary topics of individuals' pain and misfortune stem from the unsynchronized function of their society. The, the misfunctioning, speaking of functioning, that's, that's here. The video itself isn't doing that, so if you see it somewhere else, or it's just getting screwed up here. Such as the economy, the family, and other for these thinkers, while social change can indeed be desirable, one must first look at the entire social system before considering social change. What leads to unintended impacts on a change in, say, physicians assisted suicide out of society? Might it impact the family? Always asking questions such as these when considering social change. These these thinkers often be deemed conservative, as they are by definition interested in conserving For instance, an individual 
being tolerated person, scolded them for talking in a lecture hall or an opera house, but responds nastily if similarly scolded at them. Rather than being grand claims about the nature and function of society and functionalists, or to a position grounded in the presence of inequality and conflict and conflict theorists, symbolic interactionists are more interested, well, in how individuals find meaning in their everyday lives. That aren't all. What they term subjective interpretation by way of the use of mental representations. In other words, how individuals base their interactions on what they want to do social experience. Well, this brings me to the end of the lesson, but if you want to know more, keep checking out my channel. Up next is contemporary theory, where we see a broader range of sociologists who take up the perennial questions raised by functionalists, conflict theorists, and symbolic interactions. In doing so, Oh, you guys are so nice. So I just have to, all I have to do is make videos to boost my self-esteem. That's my thing. Okay, so what type of study video would I like us? So, because I'm just, so I'm going to try different formats again. Some, the pictures, ugh, it's just, it's hard for me to do. That's a lot easier for me to do. I could do those more quickly. Um, because I, the other ones I write the script and then I do whatever. Whereas this I just take a few takes uh, and then the least atrocious of them I post. Um, but that's, uh, and I'm going to work on the area. So again, my, my partner makes films, so he's like, why would you sit there? And so I, I it's, okay, so he's going to frame me next time. Uh, so I'm going to, I have my little studio up and running. Um, okay. Okay. So I might, okay, so I think the easiest thing, yeah, so this, I, um, I might, these are a lot faster, so what I might do is, I might make ones like this first, and then he has like film software, audio software, so I can take the audio out and then put them in like picture videos later. Does that sound good? So that way you'll have both. And then, but this one I can definitely do quickly, and it's good for me, I like, like you know, writing this stuff out, it clarifies my thoughts on it anyway. Um, so it's, and I'm, when I'm making the tests and stuff, yeah. So the images, so what I'm going to do, so again, I got really carried away with all those baby pictures last time, but I love those. They're hilarious. So, um, but what I'm going to do is I'll do these, and then I'll have the audio done, and then I will make an array of videos. So some will be more in the realm of Laurentium, and they will be more kooky and whatever, but then others will be more literal. Um, so, but I do, you know, the videos are full of metaphors. They all make sense if you watch them a few times. Um, okay. Background, manga video, do both, live, live, okay, good. Yeah, so I'll do both, okay. Um, and then lastly, okay, so building on that, so what can I do to make this semester better for you? So I've only focused on study videos, but what's helpful? Um, because again, I'm trying to make SOCH A03 about SOCH all for you, so. Bring food to class. Okay. Well, you know what? See, if you guys came to my office hours, those that, that went to the test thing on Friday, I, I went a little bit wild at Dollarama, which I like to do. So I bought, um, I have little Popeyes, um, not, not the good chicken Popeyes, but the, the Popeyes little candy sticks, and I have Reese's and Skittles and all sorts of things. Um, so I have a big box in my office if you're hungry. Say hi to me in the hall. Keep doing. Can play the video in class, more tutorials, study guide. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll try to do everything that's there. More simple. That is a lifelong struggle. I'm always trying to make it more simple, so, um, but it's good. Wear five blazers on top of each other. You know what? Wait, how many do I have? Because I bought a whole bunch for this term. I end up always wearing this one. I, I actually, this was ironically the one I thought no one would like, but it's, um, not that people like it, but it's, uh, but my friend said it was good, and then, uh, but it's the lightest, because I'm a heavy sweater, so this is, and so I used to, if, for those of you that were paying attention a lot to my dress or whatever, I wore button-up shirts, but I'm too hot, it's all hot up here. Although I'm getting less hot up here, because I think I'm less nervous, so, anyway. Um, presentation of self, right, so I was totally, like, caked, it was disgusting the first time, so, 
Not the people that sweat are disgusting, but you know. Um, OK, so assignment. So you're going to see the law. It's going to go live right now. Um, so again, some of the tutorials, questions aren't there. Everyone's aren't anyway, but this is enough to get you started. Um, so I'm going to make it live. And just please let me know once you can see these. OK, they're all there now. So they should all be published. Um, so if I open, so you'll see the questions. So again, so for this assignment, again, there's no rush, because I believe this is due March 25th or, I th or the 6th, whatever the Monday is of, of that. Uh, I'll open that up too, but it's, um, it's quite a ways away. So um, I keep, yeah, let me just see. Mm -mm. Again, I changed the syllabus a bit, so I highlighted the changes. There's, everything's the same, so just no one go, go to tutorials next week or the week after. There's none. Um, the next tutorials are the week of February 11th. Uh, okay, yeah, so the, de the deadline of um, assignment three, again, is March 25th, so lots of time. But you do want to get started on this sooner than later. Um, Qualitative methods, as you'll see, it's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. I mean, and honestly, and I, and I can say this, oh, and it, it made my, it made my, uh, my month when uh, Patricia, my TA, she told me that um, some students actually took my advice and uh, asked their dates, their, their crushes out for interviews, which was hilarious. They were rejected, but they took it well, apparently. So um, keep doing that, you know, it's funny, right? No one, you know, it's a good way. What do you have to lose, right? A little bit of ego at the time, but then, you know, Anyway, um, so it's not due for a long time, but I would recommend, you know, and, and you can do as many interviews as you want, right? As long as you sign the consent forms, you can do practice ones. There's no obligation to do that, though. Um, but, you know, they're fun. It, it, once you choose a topic that's meaningful or important to you of the three, um, I think role conflict, if you can't find anything, role conflict would be interesting, asking an upper year student. Again, you could go to the launch pad. Uh, imagine this, it would make their world if all of you went to the launch pad and then they'd say, oh my god, we need to do this more. Um, and then you start asking people, upper year students, you know, oh, could I interview you? Um, they would like it and you would like it. Um, so anyway, so for this assignment, you'll see the questions. Um, I'll just show you first. You have to, again, I'll, I might be posting some more based on the ones that, that uh, that um, I select, but I chose quite a few. So again, the rule is, because of the ethics board, you have to use questions that I posted on these lists. You can't use your own. Although, of course, you can change the wordings like, slightly as you're talking, and I, I have no way of knowing. Um, but you know, using uh, academic honesty and stuff, you should try to stay as close to these as possible. Um, again, just, just for institutional safety and all of that. Um, and again, it's just to make sure, you know, I, again, I, I do this kind of research myself, and sometimes you can ask things that are unintentionally harmful, right? And so I've, I've just thought a lot about what things I think, uh, especially in something like religion. You don't want to be too direct. You don't want to, um, yeah. Did you say you have to use uh, from this question, or are these possible questions that you can make new No, you have to use from the questions posted. Yeah, you can't make up your own questions. Um, so again, in grad school, if you want to do this, or a qualitative methods class, you can. But the way the ethics procedure worked is I only got the questions that I made approved. So these questions are many of yours, because I took them from tutorials. But basically, I have to approve them first. So if you really want to ask your own questions, email them to me first, and I can then approve or not. But basically, they have to be approved. And I think these are wide enough. But of course, you're free to email me, and I'll, I'll give you a quick yay or nay. I won't go into in-depth explanation. You can talk to me, but um, I'll just say, you know, uh, uh, sorry, this is too personal or whatever. Um, like, you can't ask people, like, I can't even ask in my own research about people's, like, addiction pasts and things like you. Like, something might come up with you based on something someone says. Um, you could, you know, if someone brings something up, you can say, oh, could you expand on that for me? But I can't, as a professor, approve, like, something that I don't have ethics for. Um, so you'll see here, um, you know, Religion, it's very small, but there's a ton of probes. So remember, I'll discuss this more next week, but probes, again, are getting people to open up. So for the case of religion, because that's what we're doing this week, remember the research question. That's not what you're asking people, but that's what it's about. So the, what roles does religion play in people's lives? So you would ask very openly in the beginning, can you tell me how religion is a part of your life? And then, based on what they say, you would then use one or more of these. 
So some students ask me if there's any limitations on the number of questions. No. Some people, so in terms of my own interviews, I, I did very long interviews with people. I did ones ranging between one and three hours. Well, it's not that long, long compared to this. Um, but one was only 20 minutes, and I asked him like 50 questions, because he just literally was yes or no on everything, and he would not open up. Um, but other people, I only got like five questions in, and it was three hours long, because they kept going and going, and then we, I kept probing. Um, so anyway, so let's say an interview starts. Hey, can you, hey Bobby, can you tell me about the role of religion in your life? Why are you like, what, what does it play in your life? And then they say, oh, it plays a big part. And then you say, okay, um, you know, if, if you you go on that. So if they say it plays a big part, then maybe you'd say, oh, do, oh, do your friends, family, or social circles influence your practices? Um, and then they'll say, you know, yeah, like, you know, we were part of the same church, uh, the same prayer circles, the same after school things. And then you say, oh, so like what sort of benefits do you feel you get from your religion? Because you just said, you know, you're, you spend a lot of time doing it. Um, and then, you know, you could clarify how often do you engage in it. So, so again, it's up to you. There's no right or wrong selection of questions. You just want to think, am I answering the research question? So again, qualitative methods are very different from quantitative. In, with quantitative, you're using structured interviews, asking everyone the same thing. The two or more interviews that you do, so again, for the rule, you have to do a minimum of two, but you're free to do more. No pressure. Again, honestly, there's no, there won't be any difference in grades, I don't think, of, between people that do two or more. So it's just up to you if you want to do more. Um, like two is total, I mean, maybe, you know, more inspired students would, would do more or something, but you could, according to the rubric and how I'm envisioning it, do two very, very good interviews. Um, and by good, I mean it's the quality of your analysis. So you want to link your data back to the research questions. Um, so even if you have a person that's very closed off in their questions, that's still good data. I made a lot of use out of that guy that only talked for 20 minutes because it was quite clear to me, you know, I was studying, um, my research question was how do people get stuck in jobs they don't like? And so for him, you know, it was a lot of more invisible things, his body language, he would like shut down on certain questions, get very defensive. That was all data. So in, in interviews, there's things that are said and not said. Um, so that's it. That's still good. It's interesting maybe to see two people that react in very different ways. Um, again, we'll have a lot of, many of the TAs, well, all of the TAs have experience in qualitative methods, so, and, and they'll be doing mock interviews and stuff. Um, but again, this is, this is a way of getting your feet wet in these methods and just seeing, you know, how, how much of a conversation these methods can be um, and, how, and how much you can learn from them. And then say, okay, this is my first time using data. How do I now link this to a theory? How do I link this to something from the course? How do I make sense of this person's experiences as a sociologist? Um, so I would recommend for now starting to think, um, looking through those three pages, uh, and seeing which questions seem the most relevant to you and making a note if there are questions you really want to ask, um, then writing it out and emailing me or asking me in person. Um, and then you would just make a note on your assignment saying that I approved it. Um, again, I just need to formally approve anything. And, and again, um, so addressing questions ahead of time. It's all about timing, right? So what I would recommend doing is maybe making a list of like, of, you know, some of them have less questions than others. So when I say questions, I mean probes too. But a total of like five to ten questions, including probes, maybe ten. Um, and then if your respondent doesn't answer all of them, that's great because they, they spoke a lot. Um, but you may need all of them with someone that's not talking. So have the list with you, but then like highlight the ones you want to use, right? So highlight 10 of them and say, okay, this is the trajectory I'm imagining. Um, and I'll go through you with those uh, later on about my suggested order. Um, again, it all depends on how they answer. So you, you want it to be a conversation and not stilted and awkward and like cutting people off and switching topics. So you just want to build on it with the questions that we have. So I thought a lot about the order of this. Um, uh, I mean, about having questions here that would fill most people's responses, um, but at the same time, you won't accidentally, um, you know, s hopefully psychologically harm them. Um, and, and you guys all came up with really great questions in tutorials. So again, there's a few tutorials. Um, I might add some questions once I get the list, um, but for now, they're pretty exhaustive. 
Um, and again, I would ask, I would let you ask anything you want, but um, you are part of Soch AO3, which is an extension of the institution, and so I can't, um, I have to use ethics for that. Um, okay, so that's everything. Um, I hope it's not, this is how I always find weather. I hope we, I want to see if it says snowfall warning one hour ago. Okay. TTC shutting down train service on line three 13 minutes ago. Does anyone taking line three? Hopefully not. I don't even remember what that is. Oh God, yeah, I know that spot. That is when I'm waiting to go to like Scarborough Town Center. Okay, yeah, so don't take that. So, so if, you're, if you're going, I, take the 905 or, the, or ugh, the stupid new express routes. Take the York Mills or the, um, the, the Kennedy. Don't go the Highland Creek or whatever, the 38, or else you'll be there. Oh, shuttle buses. I hate when they do that. They might as well not have anything. That's just so, I hate that. Anyway, don't, anyway. Okay, um, so for next week, we go into um, my favorite, so I'm really excited for next week, um, because as I said, my, all the courses I've taught, and I've taught pretty, like, three quarters of them have been on crime and deviance, um, so that's, uh, theory and deviance are my areas, so I'm really, really excited um, for the crime week. Um, I also really enjoy religion. Again, it's not um, my area of strength, per se, but um, I, I did take my undergrad in anthropology, so... I like culture and, uh, and that. But um, next week we go into crime. Um, and then we have health, disabilities, and aging, big week. Um, so both of them are fairly big, meaty weeks, lots of topics. Next week is crime and law. We'll look at, um, you know, criminology is its whole field, but it really is like a child of sociology. Um, so you'll see people I talk about too, like Robert Merton, um, functionalist. He'll, be, he'll, he'll come in uh, quite, quite big uh, next week. Um, so any questions about anything, um, please let me know. And now those interview questions are online, so you are free to get cracking whenever you want. Um, and then I will post um, an FAQ of answering kind of common questions I've received from students. And you can expect some more zany videos um, from me. Maybe, maybe I will. Oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. I do, because of this blazer, I, d I did buy like five, so I could wear the five altogether. Um, so, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm actually, so fine, I'll just tell you because you're here. The video that I'm, that I'm planning on making, I was in the shower for like an hour one day, like just going nuts. Um, I'm going to do sociological drama. So I'm going to like play out Marx, Weber, and Durkheim myself. And then with the video software, I'll have myself in like different outfits debating with myself. So I think that'll be fun. But that might be towards the end. So, but yeah, that's a, a work in progress. So I have a few things in my mind. Um, okay. All right, so get home safe. Don't get caught in the snow. And then I'll see you in a week. <laughs>